So Jim Seidel, um, again, I'm really appreciative, Jim, of, of the support that, that you've given this community by, by stepping up and sponsoring. Uh, CrowdStrike is, is, a, uh, is an endpoint security platform, an incident response company. We do threat intelligence. We do it better than any other organization in the world. We're one of the fastest, if not the fastest, growing cybersecurity companies on the planet. So we're disrupting. And we're going to talk uh, today about some, uh, you know, some of the things that we're doing and, and some of the thought leadership that we're bringing to the market. So Jim, come on up. Jim isn't going to do questions. He's got to bail and get to the airport. Uh, it's our year end, but uh, um, he's going to go for about 45 minutes. We'll take a short break, and then Brian will come up. Okay. Over to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Do some uh, sound checking and let's fire this up. Uh, it's the second time for me in Vancouver. We do two things at once. Last time I came up, I had I was really looking forward to doing some fishing, and it rained the exact amount as it just did the last two days, which blew out all the rivers and didn't know fishing at all. So I drove up to Whistler and spent the day up at Whistler and said, well, I'm coming back and I'm gonna go skiing in Whistler, thinking I would do that this past weekend, but of course it's the end of the year and I'm now without two things on my bucket list in this awesome place called Vancouver. Uh, can you see it, no? Um, maybe it's not plugged in. Try it again, maybe. You knew this was going to happen, a little technical difficulties, right? Let me plug this in again. That could be the reason. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Eight plus years ago, a colleague of mine, while investigating a campaign he would later name Shady Rat, he came to a conclusion. And this conclusion has been often repeated by many prominent individuals across the world. And this conclusion was that there were two types of organizations. Those that have been compromised and know it, and those that do not yet know. And when I was thinking about today and this presentation, it brought me back to this seminal moment eight or so years ago. And the journey that we began, the journey that allowed us to change our way of thinking that was rooted in harden the perimeter and keep the adversary out. And man, has it been an eight or so years, sometimes thinking they're dog years. But recently, while my colleague was collaborating with a couple authors on a book. He was asked, do you still believe that there are only two types of companies? And he amended his conclusion with, nope, I no longer believe. Not because the threat landscape has gotten any easier. I'd argue it's gotten more sophisticated. Or nation state tradecraft is being shared across the threat landscape. E criminal groups and hacktivists now use all the same t trade craft, making our lives a lot harder. I also believe in this revision because I've seen organizations, organizations that have been able to shift to be able to understand they can't keep the adversary out, but they can keep the adversary from meeting their objectives. Organizations that are constantly being attacked by e-criminal groups, by nation state adversaries. On the surface, you'd expect it to be more an e-crime threat landscape. They have quite a bit of PII, a bunch of data, credit card data. But in this case, they were being attacked by a nation state adversary. And this nation state adversary was tasked with capturing information on a preparation meeting for an upcoming geopolitical treaty. I know 
my positioning, then I can counter the positioning. So they decided that the best way to accomplish this task was to turn the entire building this company owned into one big listening device. They attempted to exploit the cameras, the conference room infrastructure, the telecommunication, pretty much what we're doing right here. But this organization was able to detect and respond to these nation state adversaries before they were able to accomplish those goals. Would it be more impressive if I told you that this organization has two dozen people in their security program and a $20 million budget inclusive of their labor costs? I love this organization. We're going to talk about this CISO a little bit later in the presentation. Which brings me back to the sort of the revision of the conclusion. We no longer believe that there are just two types of organizations. We believe there are companies of the third kind. Organizations that are resilient enough to understand they can't keep the adversary out, but they can keep them from meeting their objectives. Now, we all know there's a multitude of things we need to do to run a successful cybersecurity program. You live it every day. But one thing through our analysis has bubbled up to the top. One thing that we think is eclipsing all other things. And that something is speed. Speed is everything. Through this analysis, we've been able to understand the adversary techniques when they capture a beachhead and what they do on that beachhead. We call this breakout time. Breakout time is measured by understanding that adversaries, once they land, have to do specific steps before they can pivot. They have to download secondary and tertiary tradecraft, escalate privileges, harvest credentials, become persistent, do reconnaissance, and then maybe move laterally. This is the measurement, the time on that box, that's breakout time. So through further analysis, we started to ask ourselves, who's the best? Who's the fastest? Since we see about 30,000 hands-on keyboard incidents a year, we're able to sort of understand this and measure it. You may be familiar with our cryptonym system for our, how we name our adversaries. We use the national animal of the country, Russians are bears, China's pandas, and then we use spiders to capture our e-criminal groups. So who's the fastest? The bears by, by far. Coming in at just shy of 19 minutes from the time they get a beachhead and are gone off that box. Chamilla, if you're not familiar with the Chamilla, Chamilla is the official nation state animal of North Korea, and it is a mythical flying horse. They came in at two and a half hours, seven times slower than the bears, pandas at four hours, and then round out the top five, we have the kittens or the Iranians and then the e-criminal groups. So why does this matter? It matters because this is how fast we need to be. We need to be responding at lightning speed. If we had an incident at midnight, would we miss all but the spiders before we showed up at work at 8 a.m.? So Katie opened up the conference with, think about where we're going, challenge ourselves in the next decade. And we've come up with a measurement, a metric, that we believe we should be measuring ourselves, measuring our own responses. We believe this metric should be adopted by all companies and government agencies. Of course we do, it's our metric. This metric we call the 11060 rule. We need to challenge ourselves to be able to detect within one minute, triage and formulate a plan in 10 minutes, and contain the adversary in 60 minutes. Aggressive? Yeah. Forward-leaning? 
for sure. But something we should strive for. Maybe to allow you to take a bit of a deep breath, the average breakout time is an hour and 58 minutes. Okay, not 19. But it is something I think that we should really strive for. So how are we doing? With the help of a independent marketing research firm called Vance and Born, we launched a survey last fall. And we asked these questions. And we got a number of organizations to respond, 1,500 respondents, good section of types of verticals and countries and size of organizations. And then even more impressive is the IT directors and security managers. I love the fact that these were the respondents because I believe those are the individuals and the personas that are in the trenches day to day. Just one little sidebar, you may have seen that the slides turned from being really, really nice and pretty to these. And uh, these are the ones Justin built. <laughs> Actually, no, I, I built them. I just did not have the time to pretty them up. <laughs> I had to make a joke. OK, so oh, when we asked the question, how are we doing, those 1,500 respondents, how long does it take you to detect, triage, and respond? The results are that it takes us 120 hours to detect, 11 hours to respond, excuse me, 11 hours to triage and formulate a plan, and 31 more hours to contain or remediate the. It's 162 hours. It's just shy of seven days working around the clock. I love it. I love it because we're measuring it. And if we don't measure it, we can't improve it. And the fact that we're there is fine. So if you don't mind me allowing me to drop into a little bit more of the data, I think it would be interesting to see when we ask the question, how many of the respondents believe their organizations can detect in one minute? 11% think they can do it. How many are able to triage in 10 minutes? 9%. How many can respond in that one hour? 33 minutes. This is a no blame zone, but is the 33 or the third of the organizations thinking they can contain it after the 131 hours that they took to get there? Again, it's where we are. The money question. How many organizations believe they can do all three? 5%. Do I dare say companies of the third kind? A little bit more information, digging down into each one of these quickly. I thought this was interesting. We asked the question of where's the focus of the organization? Is it more on prevention or detection strategies? And this surprised me a little bit. 40% on average say they're more focused on prevention, 20% on detection. I've highlighted in the boxes the response from this great country called Canada. I really thought about this because I really thought that it would be a little bit closer, more detection focus. We've been on this journey. People know we can't keep the adversary out, but we kind of have to respond. And then I started thinking, sort of a counterpoint to this, and I started to remember we launched this last fall. And last year, the uptick of the destructive attacks, the business disruptions, the ransomware, we were coming off of Atlanta and Baltimore in the US. So I was wondering if this frame was back to, we need to be able to stop these ransomware attacks. And that kind of rolled into this. Kind of gives me the 50-50 is what I would like to see there. And it doesn't get easier any day, does it? A couple more pieces of information. I wanted to break down the 11 hours. I thought it was interesting. Five of those 11 hours is just us waiting to get to the detection. And then once we get there, we spend six more hours triaging and formulating a plan. 
Another question I thought was interesting is, how often are you able to understand who's attacking you? And if we understand who's attacking you, then we can make better decisions, faster decisions. We can formulate those plans knowing what their motives are. So half the time, I think that's great. I think that's a positive. More importantly, when we ask the question, do you really think it would help you if you knew more about the adversary? And 99% of the respondents said, absolutely. If we know who's attacking us, then we can formulate better plans. I always like to say we're either in denial or recovery. That's recovery to me. Lastly, I thought I'd just show you where you guys ended on the 31 hours at 26. Mexico thinks they can do it in 14. And then more importantly about that recovery again, two thirds think this is still too long. So thanks for allowing me to sort of dig into that because I think some of these things will come back in the next couple minutes. So what can we do? What can we do to improve our ability to respond faster? We need to embrace the new architectures, the crowdsourced shared models that allow us to have an asymmetrical advantage. Community immunity, learning from each other. It's the way we can keep up. It's the way we can provide information in near real time. It's the way we can process large amounts of information. And I couldn't be more excited about this, these new architectures because again, as Justin said, our frame's endpoint, but I was looking at all of the companies that are, were on the slide, network providers, cloud-based sims, and even big data analytics companies are using the power of the crowd to help all of us make better decisions and respond faster. More importantly, we're gonna be able to drive out that complexity we don't have enough people to begin with. Why are we having them spend time on updating servers and licensing and maintenance and boxes all over the place? We can take that out and we can reallocate those dollars into improving our processes. I like to say complexity is the friend of the adversary and we help the adversary every day. We can do this more efficiently. Number two, embrace Solutions that cover the entire threat landscape. From graph analytics to machine learning, behavioral engines. I was uh, working on this presentation before all of the heightened tensions between the US and Iran. And I was planning on talking about Shamoon, which I'm gonna talk about. Everybody in this room probably knows about Shamoon, so we all know it's a wiper, malware, brings you back to the Stone Age. We couldn't have any telecommunications. We couldn't get in, you know, in the doors in the company. Our computers are blanket system disk error. It really wipes everything. It was first deployed in 2012 to an, an uh, oil and gas company. And it was developed by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC. And ever since 2009, when Iran was hit by Stuxnet, they've really spent a lot of money bolstering their offensive capabilities, not only through the IRGC, but through their partners and contractors who are sympathetic to Iran's cause. What you may not know is that many variants of Shamoon have been used since then. One of them, not too long ago, and it did what it was supposed to. It knocked out an entire healthcare organization. They weren't able to access patient records. They couldn't dispense medicine and drugs. Lives were at risk. And I said it knocked out the entire organization. Well, everything but about 100 boxes, 100 boxes that were running next-gen machine learning, graph analytics, and behavioral engines were able to convict the, va the variant before it ran. Now, I could have used ransomware 
And one of the things that Crasher likes to do is release reports. You probably have heard of our threat report. It's an annual report. But we also do an annual report about, uh, from our services organization. And that report just launched last week, so please feel free to download it. And that report says there's still 51% of the attacks are using non-malware-based attacks, which is certainly why we need to have both machine learning and behavioral-based engines. But also says that 22% of the time, adversaries are using both. And so ransomwares continue to evolve and into something we call big game hunting. In this case, the adversary is using both tactics. They'll use malware to establish the beachhead, then they'll drop to non-malware-based living off the land techniques. They'll start to crawl around, be low and slow. They'll map your organization. They'll find out all your critical assets. And then they'll use an implant to encrypt them hoping that the destruction is so big that you'd be willing to pay a much larger ransom. A couple other thoughts on this. Again, endpoint frame, but the stack is actually using these types of new detection engines across network and sims and big data analytics, and it really, really is improving the efficacy of what we're able to provide. The last thing I want to talk about is the services report highlights through their proactive services and incident response that they did last year that none of this matters unless we're willing to turn the knobs. Meaning we have to turn solutions up enough to be able to get the prevention and detection. I talked about that CISO from the organization from the first story, and he's an amazing individual, and he's communicated to his management that they're going to turn the knobs to 11, and that yes, they may have a couple hours of business down time, but it's better than the alternative. Now, I know that doesn't work for everybody. I was talking to an individual, Tim, I think, last night, and we were talking about his utility company and you know if I'm generating power I'm gonna have a risk-based approach but my point is make sure that we're actually leveraging this because otherwise we're just adding to the complexity we have a new layer but we're not actually leveraging it we're not actually using it to its and then leverage the manufacturers because we'll be able to help you what makes sense on what, what workloads laptops go to 11 Critical infrastructure goes to four. Just making this up. Hunt. Hunt for the 1%. Machine assisted human analysis. Think of this as the human detection engine. Create lots of noise. Telemetry. Be wrong way more than you're right. Staff our hunt teams with cross-disciplinary individuals from IT, the business, security, and intelligence. And then give them the opportunity to find an, artita an artifact and pull that thread, see what's on the other side. This is the only way we're not going to miss anything. This is how we can find the really hard to finds and our managed hunt service is called Overwatch. And just like in CrowdStrike, we like to re produce reports. And they, re they produce a quarterly report. And in their last quarterly report, they highlighted some interesting trade craft. They started to see services being started and stopped, network drives being mounted, reconnaissance coming from underneath the Microsoft Distributed Transaction Controller service. Once we started to see this, we realized that this was an ongoing incident. We were pulled in pretty late, so we started to dig in and see if we could figure out what was going on. The rest of the story is, is that the adversary had compromised another part of the organization, was using 
valid credentials to RDP in. Yes, maybe some network segmentation. And they were able to replace an Oracle DLL, a DLL called OCI.DLL. Put it in the right directory and MSDCTC service picked it up, sideloaded it in the memory. The implant turned out to be a small web server, accepted post commands over HTTPS, and it just sort of melded into the normal traffic of the organization. From there, I'd tell you, it kind of ran the same attack framework as all the rest. They did reconnaissance. They, de they brought down Mimikatz and proc dump to harvest credentials. They were using RDP and WMI and VB script to move laterally. And then the implant itself took care of things like defense evasion, C2, persistence, and eventually it would have been exfil. These are the types of things that we're hunting for. The anomalous activity that the 99% of the detection engines or prevention engines just can't, just can't pick up. Know your adversary. We saw this in the results. We understand it inherently. Let's knock on wood. We go home tonight, the back door is slammed open. We call the authorities. They come over, they say, we say, who was it? What'd they do? Where, they, where are they? What'd they? How'd they get around my defenses? Oh, darn, I only have a ring on the front door. Who are they? Are they a group of teenagers or a targeting group against me? Cyber adversary, the same way. We need to get into their motivations so that we can shift our defensors to preempt future attacks. We need to get into their decision-making process. For example, if we know that they're targeting certain vulnerabilities, then we can prioritize our patch processes to cover off on those vulnerabilities. And lastly, the adversary TTPs help us with this hunt program and in our incident response program. Sidebar that a colleague of mine, Josh, is going to have a entire session on intelligence and the adversaries today at 345. Fits your schedule. I'm sure he would love to see you and he'll have a lot of cool stuff around adversaries and their tree craft. Build a plan. Build it from the top to the bottom. Okay, Jim, that's easy. Plans across. Let's make it a little bit more difficult. Test the plans. Test them to when we get muscle memory. This is where the hard part is. I have a plan, I build it, I spend all this energy, and I put it right here. This is where it becomes hard because we know we don't have enough resources, we don't know I have enough time, but this is how we get better. This is how we understand how to respond faster. I'll also bring back the knobs. Maybe this is where we spend time turning the knobs to 11 through our red teaming and our blue teaming to make sure that we can have a better idea of the risk if we turn our solutions up a notch. Automate, automate everything. Automation helps us with this lack of resources. Automation fits nicely into our mission of speed. It's like chocolate and peanut butter to me. We automate the tier one level information. We need to automate the know the adversary. We can no longer have our resources ripping apart malware in a manual process. We need to be able to move from being reactive to proactive. What do I mean by this? We should be able to grab a file we convict, and be able to say we can quarantine a file. We should be able to grab that file, run it up in an automated sandbox, rip it apart, get those IOCs, run those IOCs up against a crowdsource data set that says, here are all the variants, grab those variants, rip that apart, get those IOCs, run that up against an intelligence database and say, who is it? Take that information, put it right down into the level one and level two responders so they can use it as a way to improve their triage and formulation of plan processes. And then more importantly, we need to push that out into the perimeter. I just got hit by one variant. The adversary knows it didn't work. 
Now I've just protected my organization with 20 others. Endpoint frame again, but this is happening across the proof points and the Z scalers and the Fortinets that I saw on the screen. They're doing this in re near real time as well, ripping apart attachments, giving you that telemetry and doing it at lightning speed so that we can make decisions. Extend the organization. It's kind of funny how Justin said that there's a whole bunch of college folks here. And I was challenging with this the fact that this is a catch-all for me for resources and people that are part of the fight. That we need to challenge ourselves to get BC aware to 1,500 people next year. That we need to continue to make it a priority to mentor our youth so that we can get more of these individuals passionate about the mission, slowing down bad guys. Keep on being mentors. I was talking to someone last night and we were laughing because we're so old that cybersecurity curriculums in colleges were called computer science. But we need to continue to motivate the young, get them excited. This may be low on my priority list, but it is not. It is a high priority. And we can't do this without more people into the fight. We like to say it's one team, one fight. We do have the opportunity to shift the power from the attacker back to us, the defender. I truly believe this. Organizations that have adopted this new paradigm of security, adopting these new architectures that are powering this foundational change so that organizations can better defend themselves. Do I dare say organizations of the third kind that are resilient, that understand they can't keep the adversary out, but they can detect and respond before the adversary meets their objectives. Yes, the adversaries are fast, but we can be just as fast. And remember, speed is everything, and every second counts. Thank you so much for allowing me to kick off your day. Enjoy the rest of the conference.